Did you know that when you add the BPFO plus the BPFI, you have the number of rollers in your rolling element bearing? Welcome to our second part of challenges analyzing rolling element bearings. Um, as we have announced in our previous video, Oliver will continue covering this very important topic. And so he is here again. Thanks for picking the same shirt. <laughs> thank you, Jules. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for that little nugget of wisdom. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, in the last session we covered the specifics and the fundamental surrounding the failure analytics of rolling bearing elements. Today we would like to look into the different challenges that there are if these are in real life equipment as such they are mounted in a larger complex gearbox. So a gearbox like that, starting off with electrical motor, a coupling, driving a bevel gear on the input side, rectangular drive here. We have the first speed reduction, second speed reduction between these two gears. And we have a third gear set here to be the third gear reduction and the low speed output shaft driving some type of equipment. And this also already brings into play one of the challenges that there are. So we have an overall relatively high energy level from the driving motor, from the gear mesh between the different gear sets within the equipment, and then whatever equipment is driven on the output side, on the low speed, this is also called the, the LS, the low speed side. If this is a speed reduction gearbox that we would con consider here, and this is the HS, the high speed side of the input shaft. That piece of equipment could be anything from a steel mill, could be a rock crusher, could be an, a melt pump, um, and you can consider that in most of these applications, those equipment and the surrounding area would be considered as requiring double hearing protection to walk close up to the machine, so you can expect very high noise levels from the overall drivetrain. The challenge now is to isolate the failure relevant impacting the failure re relevant events that happen within those seven bearings addressed here in this three speed reduction stages gearbox. Um, and this requires a lot of attention to detail. So first of all, understanding the bearing failure analysis is important, but secondly also to begin with reviewing the drawings with the level of detail that is required and consider where in which direction would you consider the load zones to be. The load zone is important to have proper sensor placement. This is my acceleration sensor placed in the load zone ideally. Identifying the load zone in the equipment is where you have to begin with and consider this being the input shaft, that bevel gear will push away in this direction so you would want to have an acceleration sensor monitoring this bearing in this radial direction, but also what you see resulting forces in this radi axial direction. So you, you would want to have an axial sensor here as well. And the same here, so you go through step by step. So we have the first speed reduction gear here, and you would see like a lot of radial forces in this direction, and also thrust forces in this direction. So two acceleration sensors in this position would also be advised. So once you've made a proper job in placing all the sensors throughout your gearbox, there are other challenges surrounding this monitoring of the gearbox that deal with the many different components, as well as possibly the noise from the equipment that we've discussed before. And then there is also challenges surrounding very low RPM applications and possibly that motor even driving the equipment at variable speed. Let's get into the details, say, on analyzing the vibration on this bearing number one through this acceleration sensor. So this acceleration sensor actually produces a raw signal which is measured in G's over time. That is my time waveform data. And this is my overall energy detected within this acceleration sensor driving this signal. This overall time waveform data includes the energy detected by the sensor, which is the result of the forces of gear mesh, the motor, the driven equipment, the flow noise, and possibly also a bearing that has a failure. 
In the last session we discussed that bearing failures are emergent failures. The signatures in a good running bearing are not visible at all. Only when they do fail, the fault frequencies that we have specified here in this example case and are described through the BPFO, BPFI, fundamental train frequency or the two times ball spin frequency will only occur and appear when the bearing fails. We now need to extract the fault frequencies as they may occur within the time waveform data. The process applied in this case is a so-called spectrum analysis, a fast Fourier transformation that, not, that does not change the vibration data over time but in frequency. Now if out of the different fault frequencies that we have present here and within a specific, a specific component, say my bearing number one is my example bearing shown here in this position, I would find and identify a BPFO being present. Then I would see this one time BPFO fault frequency being present and so will I see a harmonic set of this fault frequency within my spectral plot and as explained before this may show up up to the 10th harmonic in my spectrum plot. May I ask a question here? Um, your acceleration sensor you, you, you mentioned uh, multiple times they have a specific measuring range. What, what about low speed applications? Um, it, maybe there's a situation where the uh, Measuring where the frequency that has to be measured goes below or close to the measuring range, lower measuring range of the sensor. Um, do, we, do we have any measuring signal there or does, just doesn't work when, when you're below the measuring range of the sensor? Yeah, good question. So that is also a common question we're getting from audiences is how does it work when we go to really really low RPM application and the important factor the important frequencies to keep in mind in this case is one thing is the repetition frequencies those BPFIs, BPFOs etc those are repetition frequencies of the damaging event say on the outer rays how many times per revolution do I see a BPFO impacting say if you will that is the ting 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 those are the 8.1 time impacts you would detect every single turn of the shaft and a second as important frequency is that pulse ring frequency of the component itself. Imagine you had this rolling element bearing on a string and you would excite it with a hammer and then you would hear the resonant frequency like it was a little bell, a little ringing component and that pulse ring frequency is dependent on the geometry, on the size. Smaller bearings typically have higher resonant frequencies, large bearings typically have relatively lower pulse ring frequencies and that is the audible frequency if you will at which you would hear the ting 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 at which the resonant frequency is being excited while every roller excites the bearing and the second frequency is how often do I hear this repetition frequency. But brings me to a good point so the resonant frequency or the pulse ring frequency um, say a ring frequency may be in the range of 5 to 10 kilohertz, may be in the range of 10 to 20 kilohertz or even 20 to 40 kilohertz and one technique to better nail down the fault frequency is to actually utilize exclusively the fault frequency specific, the audible frequency specific frequency in the failure analysis and as such you would take the time wave from raw data and run this through a so-called HFE process. Say my bearing of choice here has a focus frequency that we think will be excited between 10 to 20 kilohertz so we take the full time waveform data and that may be between 0 and 40 kilohertz. This is the full frequency range acquired and out of this full frequency range we would subtract and eliminate all the frequency content that is below 5 
sorry, be, 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 be below 10 kilohertz. And everything that is above 20 kilohertz should not be part of my analysis that I apply. And as we do this, the HFE stands for high frequency enveloping. The high frequency enveloping involves some more data processing, but first and foremost, it is a low pass and a high pass filter process where we will drill down the frequency range to the relevant pulse ring frequency. And by doing so, we would eliminate all the noise from the driven equipment. Gear mesh is eliminated. All of this is mainly occurring below 10 kilohertz. So this is a very focused approach. And in this scenario, we would still use this HFE say 10 to 10, 10 to 20 kilohertz at my pulse ring frequency. And we would again look out for this repetitive impacting of BPFO, BPFI, ball spin, and cage frequency within this selected frequency range. But when you have a machine with a variable speed, uh, may I assume that the audible frequency changes when the speed changes, so the tone is getting higher? the faster the machine runs? The, the resonant frequency, the, the ring frequency of the component is geometrically defined. So the audible or the, the, the audible frequency of the component will not change. This will remain. It's the repetition frequency that will change with the change in speed. And very importantly, some machines like this could be, for example, a melt pump in an extrusion process. Those machines are driven by a, um, a VFD, a variable frequency drive. And in this case, it is extremely important that on the high speed shaft, we have to have a speed sensor to accommodate for the change in speed as we go through the different speed or load changes here. But speed is the relevant factor here. The frequency I'm showing here in my spectrograph should be calibrated in orders and not in hertz. And that is relevant because we calibrate the fault frequencies related to shaft turns. And if you have a change in speed, say the machine typically runs at an RPM of six, 600 RPM. This is equivalent to 10 Hertz. So if I would calibrate my curve here or my spectrum in Hertz, my one time BPFO would be 10 hertz times 8.1, so I would see an 81 hertz fault frequency. But if I now increase the speed to 1200 RPM through this variable speed drive, my one time BPFO will shift to the second position and this one stay, will stay blank and we would not easily be able to identify the harmonic set in my spectral data. We eliminate this by calibrating the frequency to show up in orders. Orders means harmonics of the run speed, and this solves the challenges of variable speed, and is very important then to track the speed of every single revolution data recorded, and to accommodate that in the time waveform as well as in the spectral and high frequency enveloped failure analytics, that every single turn of the shaft is properly tracked with its corresponding speed. Yeah, and I hope we covered all the different challenges that there I, I, are. I still have one question, but uh, next Please. time I, I will give you a larger chalkboard, a chalkboard for you. Um, in one of our other videos, we uh, talked about instrumentation of reciprocating compressors, and it was, and uh, my learning was that it is possible to monitor s several components with only one sensor. Is it also possible in the world of bearing monitoring? Yes, this is also possible or yes, we would have multiple sensors recommended to be installed on this example uh, gearbox in this case and each of those sensors that are, is being installed, for example, a radial sensor installed in this position could very well look at the machinery health of those two bearings, but at the same time there may be additional sensors mounted in radial direction as well that would look after the health of these three. This gives two consequential benefits. One is every sensor looks after the health of multiple components. And secondly, every component is looked after by multiple sensors. So you have like a mesh 
of sensors looking after the overall health and there is redundancy built in and in case of failures coming up you have additional confirmation from sensors closer or further away from the damage and in reality we really don't always know up front in which way the damaging energy will propagate through the equipment. Okay, impressive. Um, you're finished. Thank or you will you go on for the next two hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, we've covered this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for, for being here. Um, I hope you enjoyed what we have learned today. And uh, see you next time here on Intelligent Machine Monitoring.